So compelled by conversation, the value of conversations, tonight's speaker admitted to me, I guess partly in jest, that should someone point out a burning building behind him, he might turn around to quickly acknowledge it, but then likely would return to the conversation that he was having. So it's fitting that he's dedicating his efforts and his attention on the importance of dialogue, communication, connection, and the significance of words. Brent Hamachek, author of the Amazon top new release, Dissidently Speaking, Change the Words, Change the War, is the VP and associate publisher for the Human Events Media Group. He's the author of numerous books and es essays, including collaborating with Charlie Kirk on his first book, Time for a Turning Point. Remember when we had Charlie here when he was just a puppy? Yeah. He's also the co-author of Zelenko with the late and heroic in the truest sense of the word, Dr. Vladimir Zelenko. Brent, along with forum friend uh, Felisa Blasek, co-founded Common Ground Campus. Carving a path toward restoring civility, Common Ground Campus hosts unique events which replace contentious debate with bridging the divide. In addition to being the speaker that reopened in-person events here at the Liberty Forum in July of 2021, after our absurdly long and harsh shutdowns, he returned to moderate a very powerful panel of dissidents in March of 22. Brent has been a featured speaker in the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and spoken at a United Nations conference. In addition, Brent has had his own successful consulting practice since 2000. He specializes in solving problems that others have been able to solve. It's a heavy lift, but he's not just a scholar, he's also a weightlifter, so he remains, remains resolved. Please help me welcome back good friend of the forum, Brent Hamachek. Thank you so much. It is a treat to be back here. You know, to, to be back for the third time, to think that it was three years ago when I was first here. Uh, and then the event we did with the Victims of Communism panel. And now to be invited back again. Kind of reminded when I was a kid, my, when my parents, we'd go over to somebody's house for dinner. And my dad would say to the host uh, afterwards, wow, that was a really good meal. And she'd say, oh, Hammy, you had to say that. And he'd say, well, I know I did, but I didn't have to go back for seconds. All right, so you didn't have to have me back a third time. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be back here. I wanna thank Jane for placing her trust in me to invite me again uh, and to the forum, you know, the governing bodies of this, uh, or board of this uh, institution for allowing me to come back, all of you to, for being here. And I always stand at a podium and I always thank Charlie Kirk before I start speaking anywhere because if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be speaking anywhere. And as a 19-year-old kid who spotted something in me that nobody else had ever seen, maybe I had a glimpse of it when I was 19, but it all went away. And so I wouldn't be up here tonight if it weren't for him having given me an opportunity. I'm grateful for that. And you're all so friendly. Uh, one of the ladies here took notes the last time I spoke and she had me sign her notes. That's the coolest thing ever. And, and, you know, and I, I showed up here tonight without, I was really sort of having some self-esteem issues because I've been here a couple days and, I don't know, California makes me feel fat. I, um, so I, you know, there's all these pretty people out here, uh, but then I come into this room and you're all so welcoming and you're all so gracious and it's, it's really genuinely appreciated. So, um, by the way, I am very changed since the last time I was here. Mostly I'm older. I like to tell people now I'm elderly. It's fun. They hold doors. They do all kinds of neat stuff for me. So I, I actually even take, take notes now. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about, and you're going to participate. One of the things a friend of mine said, he said, oh my God, you're going back for the third time. How will you hold their attention? And I said, I can't. Uh, there's no, nothing I can do. And I said, I know, I'm gonna have them help me. So you're gonna help me tonight. We're gonna have some audience participation, which I understand is a little different for the forum, so we're gonna mix things up, uh, but it'll help keep me on track because at my age, I need breaks. So you're gonna help me. Uh, but we're gonna talk about some of the ideas that are in this book, and this is a book of ideas. And by the way, just isn't that a great cover? I mean, it's a great cover. I had nothing to do with the cover of the title. My, 
uh, colleague, Felissa Blazak, uh, designed it. I joke with her that it's going to be the first book in history that sells a million copies and nobody reads. They're just going to buy it for table art. So this will be seen all across America laying on coffee tables and people have no idea what it's about. Except for you because you're here tonight and I'm going to give you an idea of what it's about as we go through the evening. Now, one of the things that's a problem is that they give me technology that I have to use. So let's see if this works. I'm going to see if I push the right button. I did. All right. So uh, you saw me speak here before. You know I love philosophers, right? And I love history and I love ideas. And the book's a book about ideas. So this is a picture of Rene Descartes. Probably the, really on some level, there's so many fathers of the Enlightenment, but he was one of them. And he was sort of the king of reason. And you see the, the heading on the slide is the spoon bent. Descartes was always encouraging us to say, can we really trust our senses? Can we really trust what we think we're seeing or experiencing? Look at the spoon in the water. It's bent, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not really bent, but it looks like it's bent. We can see that it's bent. So we've got to look deeper. We've got to test more. He is, of course, the, the founder of the great expression, uh, je pense dont je suis, I think, therefore I am. Uh, but in this case, it's je ne pas, uh, let me see. I actually wrote this down because I can't speak French anymore. It is je ne pense dont je ne suis pas. I don't think, therefore I'm not. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's what's going on in America today too often. Have a simple goal with this book, a simple goal for tonight. Here's the goal. I, I want to take a couple of words in your minds and I want to flip them. I want you to take the words, it is, and I want you to turn it into, is it? And I want you to take the idea of, they are, and I want you to ask, are they? And most importantly, most importantly, I want you to think really hard about saying, I am, and start to ask, am I? So this is a simple goal of the book. We live in a country today where a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to figure out a lot of things that don't actually really matter and not enough time trying to figure out the things that do. And I would suggest to you that there's nothing more dangerous to a free society, nothing more dangerous than an axiom that isn't true. And we have a lot of things that we take as being axiomatic that aren't true at all. So let's get started. We have a little bit of fun. I kind of think, you know, it's fun, I do this sometimes. If you're willing, right, if you've got a piece of jewelry that you wear all the time, maybe take it off and put it on your lap. And the reason I suggest you do that is that if you're willing to physically part with something that makes you comfortable, then perhaps it will set your mind in a place where you might get willing to part with some preconceived notions, okay? So, uh, participation in the jewelry removal process is optional, not a requirement to remain in the room. I am not an authoritarian. All right. So, if you Google the Hamachek family, you will find out we have a claim to fame. Um, I think it was my great-great-grandfather uh, who was involved in the invention of the pea vining machine. Many, back in the 1800s. There's still a Hamachek pea vining company in Wisconsin, my goodness. No, I didn't get any of the money, that's why I'm wearing simple linen. Uh, but, uh, so that's our claim to fame. And my father, who was born in 1912, told a story about working in a pea canning plant when he was young. And he said they'd be running the line and canning the peas, and they'd blow a whistle and they'd stop the line, right? And when they did that, they would do a changeover and they would go from a can of peas that said peas to premium peas and then they'd start the line again and you guessed it it was the same peas so we've gotten extraordinarily good at placing labels on people in this country extraordinarily good people things that we see we're going to challenge some labels tonight all right we're going to do a little audience participation. On your chair, everybody should have a, had, had a pen. They're cheap, by the way, you can keep them. Jane said, oh, why don't you have, you know, monogram pens, Bridge Charities pens. I said, oh, 
goodness, I, you know, there's, there's limits to how far I'll go. But uh, in any event, so you got a pen and a piece of paper. And here's what I want you to do. On that piece of paper, I want you to label those five points on the political continuum. So we got a point all the way over there on the left, and we got a point all the way over here on the right, and we've got a midpoint, and we've got two other points, those funny X's. So I want you to just don't copy. It de defeats the whole purpose, right? So no copying, fill it in. And now we're going to do something where I'm going to say, don't try this at home. I'm going to come down on the floor. Bear with me. So, Thank you. Okay, everybody hear me? Yep. All right, good. Or not good. I mean, you'll be the judge of that, right? I mean, it's like, I, I wish I didn't hear this guy. Um, I need three brave volunteers who are going to be willing to come up front with me and answer two simple questions. The, and of the three, two of you have to leave the room. You're not being punished. It's like shtick. It's part of the whole thing. All right? So I need three volunteers. Who's courageous enough to come up here? Sir, there's one. Please stand. I need two more. Come on, two more volunteers. There's another one, please. Thank you. And this lovely lady in the back. All right, so I'm going to ask if um, you, sir, would be good enough, along with this lovely lady who volunteered, to be escorted uh, where you can't hear. Uh, so follow Jane. Put them in our um, Liberty Form of Silicon Valley zone of silence, cone of silence. <laughs> All right. There's a reason for this, and I know it's unusual. Look at me. I'm unusual. Everything about this is unusual. All right, so uh, let, tell everyone your name. Terry. Terry, this is Terry. This feels a little bit like, uh, like the Maury Povich show or something, right? So, so Terry, she says that kid is really yours. Is it, no, no. I'm <laughs> kidding. That's not what this is about. So. It was a lovely little lamb. It was delicious. Ah, that's, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, <laughs> so what I want you to do, I'm going to ask you two questions. I want you to just define for the audience in your own words what it means to be far left and what it means to be far right. Okay, far left. I'm a libertarian, so we tend to think that we don't think left right. We think in diamond shape, state versus the individual. Okay. But far left, far right. Far left, uh, Marxist Democrat. Okay. All right. Far right. Far right, depending on who you talk to, uh, either a uh, constitutional supporter of the government that was originally founded, or a neo-Nazi fascist communist dictator. Okay, then. Uh, every, everybody got that? Those are good answers. They're good answers. Thank you for, thank you for participating. And good luck with ch the child. Uh, the, the chairs enjoyed the moment. Would one of you come in? Well, let's send in our next wonderful, courageous volunteer. Me? Oh, I gotta go. All right. It's called dead air time. This is really bad in radio. It's not so bad in a live audience. You guys got some. You got homework to do. I had to put my jewelry right. back on. Ah, there we go. All right. And your name is Robert. All right, Robert. I got a, a simple question for you. I want you to define in your own words what it means to be far right and far left. Um, far right would probably be extreme, extremely far right, and far left would be all liberals in America. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was, was, uh, sorry, I was trying to be funny. No, I, 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 look, you're doing better in the room than you are. Yeah. How many want Robert to just do the rest of this? I think it might not be a bad idea. All right, so uh, far right, you said, though, was just so extreme? Yeah, extreme. Extreme okay. far right. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Everybody got that? A little different, right, than the, the last answers. We have one more participant. Come on in. The other two are still living. It's all good. No harm's been done. All right. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. What is your name? Laura. 
All right, Laura, I have a simple question for you. I want you to tell everybody in the room what it means to be far right and what it means to be far left. A non-thinker. Okay, that's which one? Both. Both, okay. So, so right before you get to be a non-thinker, is there any way that you would uh, define what a far right or far left person is like? I mean, we use those terms all the time. I'm just wondering, what do they mean to you when you hear them? Extreme. Okay, all right. Uh, closed. Um, angry. Those are, all good, those are all good things. Round of applause for our three volunteers. Thank you so much. And thank you for not cheating. I noticed you never stuck your head inside the door. All right. So we know, by the way, that we use the terms left and right all the time. We hear it everywhere, far left, far right, all the time. Now these three people who are courageous enough to volunteer and come up here, did you notice that their answers, when they gave them, didn't necessarily uh, match up one for the other, or they weren't necessarily specific. They, there, there was a sense of the people maybe being close-minded or something, maybe liberal. But here's the thing. We're using these terms all the time in this country, in every public forum. We use them in our living rooms. They're on television. And what did I literally just prove to you? I just proved to you there isn't even any real necessary agreement or understanding about what they mean. What they actually are, are just simply pejorative terms. They're just terms we use to be able to insult people who don't agree with us. So you'll hear somebody say, you know, that guy's a far left loon. And they'll say, but you won't hear them say, and I'm a far right nutty crazy person myself. They don't do that. They'll say, they're a far left loon, and I'm a moderate. <laughs> right? So we don't want to use those terms. So I gave you homework, and I know I can't walk around the room too much. Just get people to maybe share. Uh, did you do your homework? All right, on the farthest left position, farthest left, what did you write? You wrote a communist. What did you write on the furthest right position? Okay, communist on the left, fascist on the right. What did you put in the middle? Independent or moderate. Independent or moderate. Okay, what did you put halfway between far left and your middle point? A Democrat, liberal. Democrat, liberal. So let's see, we go from, so we go from being a communist to a liberal to a moderate. What's in the next spot? A Republican conservative, and then you become a fascist. Okay, I'm with you. There are, extremes are extremes, you're right. All right, who else? Sir, what did you write down? What did you put for far left? Uh, looking by. You didn't put anything yet. You're waiting to see what other people do. How about the lovely lady next to you? Anybody, what did you fill in? Okay, all right, it's interesting. Who else can give me one? Who's willing to volunteer something, something else? Help me out. You're all looking at your sheet of paper. Yes, ma'am. Totally careless. Which one is that? Is that far, far overly conservative? Okay. Um, and then conservative to follow rules as intended to follow God's moral standards and then the far right was overly conservative to the point of fearful okay all good stuff thank you very thoughtful by the way a lot of detail so here's the problem and all of you can look at your own answers and then now you can look at the person next to you here's what you're gonna find no two people in this room I would be willing to wager have the same thing written above all five spaces. Is that a big deal? I argue it's a very big deal. That if we can't get rid of the terms right and left in this country, we can't even begin to heal it. Because they have no objective meaning. 
None. Zero. We just proved that. We're going to prove it a little bit more and have some fun. This is where audience participates by voting. So this is much easier. There's no, you don't get called on or anything. Well, I might call on you. I shouldn't lie. It might, it might be a trick. I'm going to give you two names. And I want you to tell me who's further right. Rand Paul or Ted Cruz? So first, how many think Rand Paul is further right than Ted Cruz? Raise your hand. OK? And the rest of you, if you think Ted Cruz is further right, raise your hand. OK? This lovely lady here. See, I know I called on somebody again, right? So you said Ted Cruz. Do you, can you tell me? Oh, Jane's running with the microphone. You know, Jane's a size zero on her way to being a size negative six at the end of tonight with all this running around. So, all right, so uh, why is Ted Cruz further right? I think he has more conservative um, views about um, guns and um, uh, immigration on the southern border than Rand Paul. And okay. I, I think Rand has, um, more, he's more of a freedom fighter and more uh, trying to uh, um, make sure that Americans still have a lot of their freedom and liberty, liberties. Okay, thank you. Who thinks uh, Rand Paul is further right? Who said that? I want, uh, Jane, you want to run to the back of the room and lose another dress size? Tell me why Rand Paul is further right than Ted Cruz. Paul, Paul, uh, Rand Paul is further right because he's uh, America first, whereas Ted Cruz is a shill for uh, globalists. Okay. So being, so being very uh, nationalist yeah. makes Rand Paul yeah. further right? Further right in the sense that he's uh, closer to the ideals of pure conservatism. Okay. Not the right. BS that they uh, claim uh, as they... Uh, Okay. Th thank you. Next question. Another survey, audience participation. Who's further right, Rand Paul or Donald Trump? Rand Paul, raise your hand. Donald Trump, raise your hand. Keep him up. Young lady, will you, will you share why Donald Trump is further to the right? We're not going to make Jane run for this. Uh, well, I think he has... Uh, I think a lot of his principles, well, I don't know, I'm not sure. I, I think his piece, he's more principled okay. uh, uh, as far as our country is concerned. He's more uh, a constitutionalist. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, who thinks uh, Rand Paul, who's further right than Donald Trump? Go ahead. Well, I, I defined left and right as I, I agreed with the communist on the far left, but I saw right as going toward more freedom and liberty. So I put libertarians on the far right, and I think of Rand Paul as fitting that libertarian description more than Donald Trump. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. One more. One more. Who's further right? By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a heads up. You're not going to have to defend your answer on this. You won't be called on. I want you to tell me who's further right. Rand Paul or Adolf Hitler. How many people think Rand Paul is further right? Raise your hand. Okay, we got a few. How many people think Adolf Hitler is further right? Okay. So, here's, here's the, the problem. I hope that you can see the problem. Do you realize what we've just done? I'm not terribly bright. I'm not a magician. I'm not that clever. And yet, just with a few simple questions, I have tied the room in knots. And let's try to untie that now. All right? Because this matters. This is so important. So important. It's fundamental. How much time do you spend seeing on the news, well, he's a far right this, or he's a far left that, or a center right this, or... Guess what? They don't know what they mean any more than you do. They don't. They're just insulting whoever they're talking about. Because these terms are undefined. They're just pejoratives. They're just a way 
for us to be able to label somebody as being the opposite of us so that we don't have to deal with them. We don't have to engage them. He's far left. I don't have to deal with him. This is dangerous, and this is tearing the country apart. Remember the P's, right? So I'm going to go back on stage, but here's the thing. So I mentioned at the beginning I, I am elderly, so this time I'm going to take the stairs. <laughs> Plus, I think California really has made me fat, and I'm afraid that my slacks will tear if I go up the stairs. And then you're all just going to leave the room. So uh, I'll be right back. All right, a big welcome for Bren Hamachek, everybody. Thank you. That's just so self-absorbed that I did that. All right, we just played that game. Here's the traditional political continuum. This is where the, the terms came from, or not came from originated, but this is what they're traditionally associated with. Somebody, one of the people in the audience, had uh, communism on the left and fascism on the right. Now, if, if, if you buy a copy of our book, all proceeds go to charity, by the way, to our program to teach this to young people and teach them how to engage civilly with one another, you will learn the whole history, all right? The evolution of how this developed in this country. I promise you, it's all there. But I'm wondering, does anybody know where the terms right wing, left wing came from? Gentleman in the back, holler it out. That's right, he's got it. During the French Revolution, the French National Assembly convened with the friends of the monarchy on the right side of the room and the commoners, the people, the proletariat, sitting over here on the left. Do you know why that was? Let's go one level deeper. That's where it came from. The reason is that in French formal dining uh, settings, your distinguished guests are seated on the right-hand side of the table to the host. So think about this, folks. These labels that we're using are derived from French table manners in the 18th century. How good does that make you feel? And here's the really important thing about that. Think about how important this is. Those terms came from seating arrangements from French dining, and it happened to be the way the room was organized in a meeting hall in France. It had nothing to do with a continuum. It had nothing to do with uh, any sort of set uh, philosophies or anything else. We have been backing into, backing into, the use of these terms and trying to apply them to our politics for 250 years. It's a contrivance. It doesn't exist. Don't use them anymore. You want to make a big contribution to healing America? Stop using the terms right and left. Stop using them. But I'll give you something else to use. So what is going on? We have a problem in this country because we keep trying to figure out how to come up with one way to label what's taking place. Here's the problem. It doesn't work. You need two models. One explains behavior, and the other explains position and direction. You can't see this from here. If you buy a book, you'll be able to read it. So I make it small like that to tease you. <laughs> and I'm not shamelessly plugging books, by the way. It really is true that all the proceeds uh, from this book do go to support uh, our work with young people to try to get them to engage with one another civilly again. Uh, we have wonderful programs that, all of which my partner created. I just work here. She's got the brains in the group, but wonderful programs. Anyway, we have two teams in America. Team right, team left. I only use the terms right and left to make you comfortable because everybody's been used to using the word. But here's how it works. And in the book, I go through the history of how these teams have formed. Now think of a football team. You've got offense, defense, special teams, different platoons. These teams all have platoons. On team left, you have the folks that are, say, pro-choice. On team right, you have the people that are pro-life. On uh, team left, you have the people that want to uh, restrict 
uh, the, the right to bear arms. On Team Right, you have the folks that are big pro Second Amendment people. Here's what I learned in interviewing people all over the country when I originally put this together. People wind up on one of the two political teams because of their primary issue. So let's say that what really matters to you is that you're pro-life. You're going to find yourself on Team Right because that's where the pro-life platoon lives. Now what does pro-life have anything to do with, say, free market economics? The answer, by the way, I'll help you. It's nothing. There's nothing to do with it. But what do good teammates do? Good teammates support their team. So what happens in this country, this is a dynamic structure, by the way. It moves. Imagine you're a football team with a really good offense. Really good offense, OK? They become the most important part of that team. They carry the defense. They carry the special teams. Because in the moment, they're the most important. During the pandemic, we had two brand new platoons form. The pro-mandate platoon, it landed on team left. And the resistance movement, if you will, that landed on team right. Those two platoons did not exist prior to the pandemic. And what happened? Well, they became the most important platoons on each team because it was the biggest issue in the country. So what happens if you're a bad teammate? Let me suggest to you that the best example, and it's mentioned in the book, is my friend Naomi Wolf. Now, Naomi Wolf was a platoon leader on Team Left for decades, the third wave of feminism, right? So that, that whole women's rights platoon on Team Left, Naomi Wolf was a leader, and she was loved on Team Left. But during the pandemic, Naomi Wolf, by the way, is such a brilliant writer. When I see something she writes, I tell her, you make me feel like a third grader. I start typing in crayon after I read her stuff. She's so good. But she's an independent thinker. And when she started to look at what's going on with the mandates and the vaccine, all the stuff, she said, I don't buy this. And what did she do? She broke orthodoxy with her teammates. And not just that, the pro-mandate platoon on Team Left during the pandemic, they were the most important platoon on Team Left. And when she broke orthodoxy, she was vilified. Team Left put her on waivers because she dared to show the courage of independent thought. So what we need to focus on in America is understanding how this team structure works, the dynamics of it, how different platoons elevate in importance at varying times, and what you need to do as individuals. Sometimes if you find yourself, here, anybody notice that when you're talking about an issue with somebody, it can start really well, and then very quickly it deteriorates. It's kind of like that old commercial, you know, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? You know, one, two, three, right? They go from reasonable to relatively insane in a matter of moments. Why? I can tell you why. If, 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 if you're a bad guitar player, you turn up the amplifier. If you're a bad cook, you add a lot of spice. So you turn up the sound and you turn up the heat. And it compensates for your lack of knowledge. Because if I'm on team left, and I'm all about being pro-choice, and that's why I'm there, and now there's somebody arguing about how we need to restrict guns and the gun things, there's debates going on. I'm going to say, yeah, of course we, yes, we need, we need to restrict guns. Of course we do. Well, why? Well, because people get shot. Well, does, what, 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 do you think restricting them would just solve that problem? Oh, why are you asking me that? You're just hateful and evil, and there they go. Why is that? So what will happen is that somebody will start to aggressively uh, engage in that conversation because they really don't know what they're talking about. 
They really don't honestly care not that much. It's not what keeps them up at night. But they're going to support their teammates. And I bet, if you're honest, and you ask the question, am I, you might find that even you do that sometimes yourself. Because it's human nature. So the key to solving division in America, a big part of it, is to break up these teams. If you're on one, leave it. Resign. Don't be on a team. Don't move to the other team. As long as this structure exists, teams play to win. That means you can never solve a problem by definition. Here's the real political continuum, by the way. There's no debate on this. I'm sorry for the assuredness with which I say that, but there is no debate. A continuum needs to be a line where movement in one direction or the other actually makes sequential sense. There is no other continuum you can create that makes sequential sense besides this one. This is it. On the far left, once we make a social contract to leave the state of nature and not live like un unregulated, ungoverned animals, we step into a, a, a society with very little government, right? We're just going to give up a little bit of our freedom, just to have a few rules. And then each time we decide to have more rules, we start to give up more individual freedom. In fact, it's the question we ask, should ask, before we pass any law. If we see a problem as a country, we ought to ask, how much individual liberty am I willing to give up to address this problem? It doesn't mean you shouldn't give up individual liberty. It means you have to ask how much, right? So as you increasingly have more government and move further away from that state of nature, you eventually get to a point, an inflection point, where you could call somebody, perhaps they're a, a moderate if you wanted to, but it's an inflection point. And that means in mathematics where the slope of the curve changes and things start to happen at an accelerated rate. Now we've crossed in my mind that moderate point in terms of government and its control over us in this country. I think that we're on the part of that curve where now we're losing our freedom at an increasing rate, faster. All roads end in totalitarianism, one of its many forms. So I would urge everybody to really think hard. The next time you go to use the term right or left to describe somebody, I want you to just stop for a minute and think, do I really want to say that? Will they really know what I mean? Do I really know what I mean? I think our exercise tonight proved that maybe we don't. All right. We're going to do another thing. I had to come down again. Is there anybody in here who's good with art? I want to talk to you about a couple more things. Anybody in here good with art? <laughs> Commenting, recognizing famous pieces like art knowledge, humanities. I'm trying to show you folks, by the way, that I have range. So it's like, oh, he's talking about political theory and everything. No, no, no. Let's do, let's do humanities. All right. All right. All right. Well, let's do it as a group. I'm going to show you. So we're going to leave the right left topic. I hope you all got it that I, I want you to start asking, is it about that? Would everybody promise me to do that? Would you promise to think a little bit harder about that going forward than maybe you have before? All right, because if you'll do that, I love mild applause. I feel like I just sank a pun on 17. So that was good. It was like a little golf clap. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to do a couple more topics before we, before we uh, close this out and take some questions. Four famous pieces of art. Ready? You're all going to recognize them. You, you got them? I know you got them. Somebody's probably Googling them. They're putting them. It's tough, right, because um, here's, you're not used to seeing them in this way. 
So allow me to present them in a different format and see if you recognize them. There they are. All right. So I want to talk to you about what we call conspiracy theories. Because they're not theories at all, first of all. A theory is something that has been able to be tested from having been a hypothesis, then somewhat proven, and has either predictive or explanatory value. My, by the way, the team right, team left model, if you read the book and understand it, and then you watch a story in the news tomorrow, you're going to know exactly what's going to happen and how people will respond. It's a theory. It's a legitimate theory. It has predictive explanatory value. Conspiracy theories aren't conspiracy theories. They're conspiracy hypotheses. They're an idea that somebody has. And these ideas are tearing this country to shreds. And it is not, it is not the fault of the people that come up with them. It is the fault of those of us who buy them. You know, there was a gentleman, I, I, I struggled with whether or not I was going to say his name, and I'm not, because it's not my nature. But on social media a couple of weeks ago, right before the Trump trial went to, went to the jury, uh, this fellow who says he's a journalist and he's got 107,000 followers on Twitter, X, sorry, Elon, don't, don't put a chip in my head. <laughs> Goodness. Anyway, uh, he's interviewed on the street by someone and he says, yes, he said, well, the, uh, the fix is in, uh, the, the, the verdict is going to be guilty, and uh, Joe Biden is going to give a speech immediately after the verdict is announced, and so it has to be a, a fixed verdict, and otherwise he couldn't be planning to give that speech, and then it's all set up where Michael Flynn is going to step in and he's going to replace Donald Trump. N n no, he's not. Uh, <laughs> That is something that at least 107,000 folks saw right away and then shared, I don't know how. It's absolute drivel and nonsense, of course. And so much of what we're hearing today that draws us in. I said at the beginning, we're spending an awful lot of time trying to figure things out that if we get the answers, they won't really matter. And we're not enough time trying to figure out what does matter. The reason I do this thing with the constellations is that it is human nature. We've been doing it forever, where we want to take a few little data points, a few stars in the sky, and construct elaborate drawings around them. Be careful of that. And sometimes, I mean, if we think, if we can prove, um, and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't, prove things that have happened, but we need to prove things, right? But a lot of the things that we're chasing as conspiracies, if we actually prove them to be true, you know what we would learn? We would learn that human beings in positions of power and influence exploit other human beings. Asked and answered by over 3,000 years of human history. Read the paper. Of course we do. This is not a news story. And here's the real danger of spending too much time trying to draw pictures from stars. Is that for every minute you spend trying to draw a picture from a star, guess what you're not doing? Anything that matters. You're not getting involved. You're not making a difference. You're not starting a program and working with young people or running for your school board. You're sitting at home watching a YouTube video and saying, I got it. I, I, I got it. And, and you know what? Michael Flynn is going to be president instead of Trump. Stop it. We can do better. We have to do better. And we're doing this to ourselves. Next problem. We've got a problem in American architecture. And it's, it's a big problem. It's in our Constitution, uh, sort of. But it's in the Constitution because when it was designed, we didn't take something into account. Okay? I'm going to show you what it is. So, we, we hear about the tyranny of the majority. Anybody ever hear that phrase, the tyranny of the majority? Comes from which founding father? Shout it out if you know. James Madison. All right. Madison in the Federalist Papers wrote and warned about the tyranny of the majority. If the majority in this country were a tyranny, 
we would have border security, no Obamacare, secure border, uh, I wrote that twice, didn't I? Uh, and voter identification requirements. So what's the problem? This is the problem. When Madison and our founding fathers put together the Constitution, they were very concerned about tyrants. Very concerned. Okay? And so Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers this concern about the fear of the tyranny of the majority. This is where, by the way, I have to go to my notes again because I'm elderly. Um, but uh, he wrote about the tyranny of the majority. And in, in the Federalist Paper where he wrote about this, he said, as to the minority, well, we don't have to worry about, oh, you've heard the term about factions, the danger of factions. That's Madison, too. So we don't have to worry about the minority. The majority will take care of them. And so everything that he wrote about and everything our founding fathers addressed was about the tyranny of the majority. But here's the problem, and they should have known better, because all of human history has been shaped by focused minorities. Look at this little square thing up here. Let me just explain it to you quickly in words. Let's do it with a harmless example. Let's say that uh, there's four people going to get together for dinner, and one of those four people keeps kosher, and the other three don't. So. The other three say, well, uh, you know, uh, Mortimer uh, keeps kosher. Uh, we don't, but it doesn't matter. We can eat kosher food, so let's keep kosher for Mortimer. And so then they all four eat kosher. Sometime later, a larger dinner party is planned. There's going to be 16 people, and the host f invites as four of the guests uh, the same four at this table. And uh, they say, oh, you know, Mortimer keeps kosher. So we've kept kosher when we're with Mortimer, and the host says, well, that's not a problem. We could do that for everyone. And so now all 16 people keep kosher. There's absolutely and positively nothing wrong with that. We call that good manners, okay? But the problem is this. It's when we accommodate an intolerant minority with different nefarious purposes. We accommodate an intolerant minority with different nefarious purposes. Uh, Mortimer with his kosher food, that's fine. But think of this. Think of this. So this is where I go to stuff I write down. Uh, and you folks have been so patient with me with the stuff I write down. We've accommodated paying for the health care of elderly people, and now we have socialized medicine. We've accommodated emission standards on cars, and now we have crippling climate and energy policies. We accommodated masks and got mandatory vaccines. And we've accommodated pronouns, and now we have disfiguring harmful surgeries taking place to little children. This is our fault. This is our fault. We have been too willing, it's been too easy for us to accommodate these sorts of things thinking, oh, well, what harm could it be? But the tyranny of the minority with our help and acquiescence is what's gotten to be at the heart of so many of our problems in the country today. How can it be fixed by the majority starting to perhaps behave a bit more like the tyrants Madison feared, uh, or at least in a more assertive and powerful way? We've lost our voice. So, you know, it's kind of funny because if you have notes and then you start to spread them around, the next thing you know, the notes are all mixed up. I have no idea where I am, but I do know I'm almost done. Oh, now I know. Hey, good news, guys. We're near the end. When I came here and talked to you three years ago, I talked to you about being a dissident. And I, everything about that talk I gave you, I hold to. I retract nothing. The essay is updated and refreshed, and it's in the book. It's in Dissidently Speaking. It's what inspired the name, right? I hold to all of it. But now there's not a period, there's a comma. How many people in this room believe that we're facing a totalitarian threat in this country today? Okay. I do too. 
I think it's a really serious threat. So sometimes it's hard to like wrap your mind around things. I, I, am, I am a simple man and I like pictures as I have been demonstrating throughout the evening. I even gave one to you on your chair that you could color in. So I'm going to give a shape. I'm going to give a shape to this totalitarian threat that we face. I'm going to give it the shape of an obelisk. Now, inside that obelisk, at the base of it, are the people who are absolutely determined and focused to take away our individual liberty. They want to control us. This, by the way, is the oldest story in man. Humans subjugating other humans. They want to do it. But now, inside that obelisk, swirling up through up to the top, are all sorts of folks who are going along with it, who don't want, who don't intend to control anybody, who aren't thinking that what they're doing is going to lead to any form of serfdom for anybody, right? They're going along with it. Now there's two ways to topple an obelisk. One is to get enough force to push against the bottom of it, ferociously to push until you gain enough momentum to have it tip over. The second way is to throw a grappling hook around the top and pull it towards you. There's a third way to topple an obelisk. And that's to push and pull at the same time. To be a good dissident, you have to know when to push. We talked about that three years ago. Somebody took notes. But to be a great dissident, you have to know how to push and pull. Because there are all kinds of people out there, many of whom folks in this room are probably labeling leftists. They they don't need to be labeled. They're not your enemies. They don't mean to be. You need to pull those people in. Sort them out from the ones against whom you have to push. Push and pull at the same time. All right. Anybody in here a Springsteen fan? Nah? Hold on. How's this for camera placement? Am I good? Ah, okay. So I am a huge Springsteen fan. No apologies. This uh, piece up behind me, uh, dear Bruce Springsteen, here's my letter to you. I wrote that piece for human events in uh, the fall of 2020, right before the election. And uh, Springsteen was uh, saying that if Trump was reelected, he was going to leave the country. And I wrote this open ed piece that. Uh, said, you know, he had an album that came out called Letter to You. And I said, here's my letter to you. And I wanted to ask him why he was going to do that and why he would desert a country over a politician. And, you know, I think Bruce Springsteen and I agree on every problem facing America. And we probably disagree on virtually every solution. But I kind of thought maybe he'd be willing to sit down and talk with me to see if we could find common ground. So let's talk a little tiny bit about common ground. So Springsteen, by the way, on this recent tour, yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times. I'm sorry. I'm just totally strung out. Uh, he's closing each show by coming out, and the band stays back. After the encore, he does one last song, an acoustic, an acoustic tune, a lot of power, and he just tries to connect with the audience. So I'm sitting in a chair. This is a hat tip to the boss. And I'm going to close this speech, talk, mm, whatever it is, with a, just a little acoustic set, okay? I'm just going to share a couple of quick stories. So I mentioned Common Ground. It's a program with multiple layers to it that my dear friend and partner, Felissa Blazak, designed, where we're working with young people and we're trying to get them to communicate constructively engage civilly and solve problems instead of debate issues. We went to Hope College in Michigan. 
in November of this past year. We were invited to come on campus to take on issues under diversity, equity, and inclusion. They were having problems on campus. We had two great students from Team Left, two great students from Team Right, okay? Proper terminology. And everything was set to go. I had gone a month ahead of time and met with them. I took them out to pizza for pizza. Folks, these kids were amazing kids. By the way, the book is dedicated to all four of them. Therese, Shane, Marley, and Yona. Ten days before the event, an intolerant political science professor, the head of the political science department, tried to get our event canceled. And he tried to get, bring pressure on the team left students to withdraw. A lot of pressure. Peer pressure, academic advisor pressure, there's emails, there's text messages. And 10 days before the event, our two team left members withdrew with apologies, but they were under so much pressure that uh, they just couldn't go through with it. And then a wonderful thing happened. A great courageous lady who I will name by the name of Kim Nagy, who's sort of like Miss Ottawa County Democrat in Michigan, talked to those students and she said, look, I've watched the video these folks do. I've, I've seen the way they perform. They play it straight. And if you want to have a career in public service, you're going to have to learn how to stand up for yourself, for your principles, honor your commitments. God love her. And so those two students said, we're in. And we had a great event at Hope College that night. And the parents of those two Team Left students were in attendance. And they came up afterwards and they said, we're so glad for what you did. We're so glad our child participated in this event. This was life changing for them. This was character building for them. And then, and then, and then, and then, after the event, we took them out uh, for pizza and beverages and as we sat at the table and I talked to these these two young team left kids you know they they probably don't agree with me much on policy but they're extraordinary and they're brilliant and they don't want to hurt anybody and and think about it though what were they when they stood up against all that pressure on campus and participated in that event what were they they were Thank you. Boy, folks have been paying attention. If I come back a fourth time, think how good you'll do. They were dissidents. They don't want to be serfs any more than we do. They're floating around inside that obelisk. And so, sometime later, we were at an event in Philadelphia, a conference between a bunch of think tanks. And the reason they were having the conference was to find ways to work together, to sort through their differences, to find common ground. It's a wonderful thing, right? And, and I thought, though, at the, at, by lunchtime that day, I, I was thinking about something. Because when the event started, everybody had a great attitude about it. And they had three speakers to launch the event before we went into groups to work. And all, so I was thinking, what if Marley and Yona had walked into the room at the beginning of the morning over breakfast, the people in that room would have been so happy to see them, so happy to see them, and they, they would have welcomed them and sat, sat them down and got them extra eggs, and it would have been great. And then the first three speakers would have stood up and talked about the evil people on the left and what the left is doing here, and the extreme left people do this, and the extreme left people are trying to hurt you here. And those two kids would have looked at each other by about 9.30 and said, what in the hell are we doing here? These people hate us. They hate us. Only the people speaking wouldn't have hated them. But they would have sounded like it. Now, I grew up in a small town in northern Michigan. And a uh, little like Bedford Falls almost, Sault Ste. Marie. Shout out to my hometown and classmates. And uh, I heard a story once from an old timer about uh, a retail store that was going to hire somebody who worked at another retail store in town uh, to come and be an assistant manager. And so they, they offered them the job. And then a story started to circulate in town that was going on that at the store where that new hire currently worked, there was some theft taking place. And he was rumored to be a part of it. And so the store that was going to hire him said, you know, look, 
hey, sorry, we've heard this stuff about you. We're not going to hire you. And he said, I, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. And he, they said, well, you know what? Uh, sorry, that's what we hear, and we're withdrawing the offer. A few days later, in the local hometown newspaper, a story breaks. Store reports employee th stealing stuff. It wasn't him. It wasn't him. And so he went back, and he said, you know, I, you guys see, it wasn't me, right? And they said, yes, we saw that. We were wrong. And he said, so, so would it be okay if we move forward and you hired me? And they said, no, I'm afraid we can't do that. And he said, but why? You, you know I wasn't stealing. And they said, well, we know that you weren't, but we had thought that you were capable of it. Imagine, imagine, imagine. In this country today, how many people are we not hiring? Not because they did something, but because in our head we had decided they were capable of it. How many people are we turning away from us? How many of our fellow countrymen are we turning our backs on because they're leftists? Right? It's dangerous. Last thought. I'm a simple man, so I live in the movies. Uh, I get most of my information from things that I can s see and hear like that. I need visual images and so on. The, one of my all-time favorite movies, nobody in the room seen because I'm the only person that ever saw it. It's called Creator with Peter O'Toole. Anybody ever see Creator? One, one person, uh, two people. Oh my God, we're having coffee after this. So the premise of the movie is uh, Peter O'Toole is this college professor. He's a genetic brilliant doctor. And he's got this young graduate student, Boris, who's his assistant. And Boris falls in love with Barbara. And it's all wonderful. And I'm not going to tell you the rest because it'll ruin the movie for you. You really ought to watch Creator. But there's a part in the movie where Barbara slips into a coma. And, and, and Peter O'Toole's character gets permission before the family pulls the plug to see if there's some way to, maybe they're misdiagnosed, maybe they can save her. And he runs a bunch of tests and everything, no, nothing looks like it's going to work. So all they have is the next 48 hours to see if she comes out of the coma. And so he's sitting in the room in the edge of her bed. And Boris is sitting there holding her hand. And Peter O'Toole leans down and he whispers to Barbara, he said, for the next two days and all for you, your delight, your young man here, Boris, is going to read to you and sing to you and tell you awful stories. He'll tell you of your unborn children that he sees. He says, and the only thing that can stop him is you. And then he looks at Boris and he says, as only Peter O'Toole could say, talk to Barbara. Words can be wonderful things. Can't they though? They can just be wonderful and they can be just as bad if we don't use them the right way. So let's try to do better, as my partner says. That's her great line for Common Ground Campus, do better. Thanks for that, Felissa. And um, let's see if we, we can't make words wonderful things. So thank you for having me. Okay. So uh, Brent, while we're waiting for the questions from the audience, I want to ask you a question. Um, that I've been thinking about. You, you say that human nature in America has escaped its constitutional walls. And I really love that quote. Would you elaborate on that? Sure. So my, my thought is this. So our founding fathers were very much driven by all of the ideas that had come before them and all the experiences that they had been through uh, with, with England. And of course, they were coming out uh, at near the tail end of the Enlightenment. And they had the, the ability to choose from some, all the great ideas that had been hatched. Two principal opposite thinkers of the Enlightenment were John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a collectivist, and Locke was uh, an individual liberty guy. And our founding fathers picked John Locke. And they said, we're going to take Locke's ideas and we're going to build a country around them, okay? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is almost a direct lift from Locke's life, liberty, and property, okay? 
So they wanted to give us a system that allowed us to be free. But they had also read the writings of a pre-enlightenment thinker by the name of Thomas Hobbes, who had warned that man's nature was really not all that pleasant. And so what they did is they gave us a system that allowed us the opportunity to be free while trying at the same time to control what they recognized as being our natural tendencies. And they built a pretty good system. But as I like to say, give a madman in a cement wall cell a, a really good spoon in an infinite amount of time, and he will dig through the walls. And we've been digging through the walls. And what's really important to think about is this. Think about this. Almost all of human history has been led with people, the many, being ruled and controlled by the few. And if that's the case throughout almost all of history, is freedom our nature? Or is freedom aspirational? I would suggest to you that freedom is not in our nature, it's aspirational. What our founding fathers did was give us a chance to chase our dreams. And we are now chasing them away. That's just my thought. Mm. Mm. What was there? Any I just sunk a twenty-foot putt at eighteen. No, that, that was, was actually. That was I, I think the audience was absorbing that because actually that was elegant. <clears throat> was there any way that our founding fathers could have seen the possibility of a takeover, a totalitarian takeover, not by government but by private industry? Like, could they have seen that in so those days? So that, that's a great question. Um, could they have foreseen what's happened with this private industry takeover that we see? Such a complex topic. Let me try to do it justice in as little time as possible so that you stay awake. All right. So one of the things that's never been contemplated when you read philosophy or economic theory or other things Marx talked about a free market society ultimately succumbing to the uprising from the workers, right? Workers of the world unite. Nobody ever thought that the leaders of free market businesses would be the ones that would try to destroy it. This is a miscalculation. It's a misunderstanding of human nature. We have powerful people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who have made all the money they need to make and now they want to take away our opportunities to make the same money. Mark Zuckerberg wants to stifle enterprise because he's already done it. Nobody contemplated this. And I don't think that our founding fathers could have envisioned such large corporate entities rising up. We live in a country today where our economic model is a fascist model. We have a large central government with large siloed industries and major players united to plan, manage, and oversee political, economic, and social activity. That's a fascist structure. And I don't think our founding fathers in a time where the term fascism didn't exist, where uh, economies and companies couldn't get this size simply because of geography and technology, I don't think they ever had a chance on that one, honestly. Um, it'd be fun to see how they addressed it if they came back today. Yeah, it would be. One of the audience members says, "With your point of view of the, with your point of the view of the quote the problem with labels, would Fox or the mainstream media allow you on air?" Oh, uh, well, first of all, I'm, it, I, I don't know that I'm special enough to get there, right? But. Um, uh, look, it makes people uncomfortable when you talk outside of conventional paradigms and sound bites. The kinds of ideas I've shared with you tonight, I hope if nothing else, if nothing else, I hope that you found them a bit original and a bit perhaps unconventional, but maybe then a bit contemplative. Uh, this is not something that's set up for the cable news networks or network television um, because it doesn't fit into a five minute segment. It doesn't lend itself to readily accepted understandings. By the way, all of which we proved tonight are wrong. In fact, there is, they're not wrong. There's no understanding. 
But, um, so no, I don't think anybody wants me on to talk about original things because I'd be bad for ratings. Uh, <laughs> One of our audience members wants to know uh, if you're bringing this to high schools because he thinks it would be fantastic and appreciated by high school students. Yeah, so we've done a couple of high school programs at Medina High School. Here, this is a great story, folks. Stay awake just a few more minutes. I love this story. So we did a Common Ground Campus event at Medina High School and the students wanted to take on the issue of student rights. There were, um, the school was suppressing different student groups from forming. There were all kinds of issues and problems. So we were going to do student rights at Medina High School in Ohio. Okay. So uh, the event is on a Tuesday night. This matters. I'll tell you why. So we always work with the students ahead of time. This is the first time we've done anything with high school kids. So we thought, wow, how will this work and how will these kids respond and will they be adult enough to pull this off and solve problems up on stage? So on Monday night, we had a Zoom meeting where we met with the participants to everybody get to know each other and we talked through it and so on. A little show prep. And uh, during the show prep, one of the students, a junior in high school, says, I wanted to let you guys know that because you're coming to the school to do this event, I got an idea to form an after school group where students could come and have open dialogue and share problems and concerns and instead of being judged or criticized we could just talk about it and he said I got a, a, a faculty advisor for it last week and we had our first sign up this morning and we got 50 students to sign up. Wow. That was on Monday. Wow. We hadn't been there yet. Wow. Just the fact that we were coming to campus to have an event to bring people together caused a student to do far more than we could have done. I mean, and I said to, I said to Felicity, do you, realize, do you realize we did this? And, well, and she's always quick to correct me. It's like, no, the student did it. And, well, yeah, but look, look what we inspired. And, and so uh, high school kids are capable. Uh, they're, they're wanting, they're willing. And that's just like a miraculous story, right? Another point about common ground, if I could, some people will say to me, you're wasting your time. There's, it's all the indoctrination. It's everywhere. It's hopeless. You can't do it. You can't reach enough kids. To which I reply, there was one Churchill. There was one Napoleon. There was one Reagan. Take your pick. I don't have to reach every kid in the country. Phyllis and I don't have to do this on every campus in the country. We have to plant seeds and hopefully touch the right person or people and have that take hold over time and grow into something. And uh, so that's, that's why we do what we do. Everybody knows the problems we face in the country seem to be uh, not sustainable. We agree the, the differences in our case were, were trying to do something. Like the folks back here at, at Braver Angels, uh, like they do, uh, compatriots. All right, now, Bryn, I know you well enough to know that I probably shouldn't ask this question because you've got to catch a plane tomorrow. Uh-oh. But here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy, I can't believe so this setup. I'm going to give you a minute, I guess, for this because you're okay. going to like it. The Enlightenment was the origin of today's extreme materialism. Can you speak, about, can you, Brent Hamachek, speak about John Locke's opponent, Libris, who was a great influence on Benjamin Franklin and other of the founding fathers? So, I, I, you trailed off a little bit. Could you maybe just read it one more time? Do you want to speak? That's not a stall tactic, by the way. I, again, I'm elderly. You guys got this, right? So, the other day, my, my uh, middle daughter said, I'm dropping off my grandson, uh, dropping off her son to play with Jenny's kids. Now, I knew what I heard her say wasn't right, and then I figured out she must have said Jenny's kids. Because to me, I heard her say, I'm taking uh, uh, Aiden over to play with the Chinese kids. <laughs> Which would have been fine, by the way. I don't, yeah, so please. Okay, so I'm asking you a question about John Locke's opponent. Uh, the, this uh, audience member says, the Enlightenment was the origin of today's extreme materialism. Can you speak about the influence of John Locke's opponent, Libritz, who was a great influence on Benjamin Franklin and other founding fathers? Well, uh, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. So here's, here's a manageable answer. Social contract theory, the idea of uh, deciding what 
life was like in what was called a state of nature, social contract theory originated with Thomas Hobbes. And then it was next written about by John Locke. And finally it was written about by Rousseau. And so those three men are the three pillars of social contract theory. Why did man leave the state of nature? A state, by the way, that nobody necessarily believes exists. It's a construct just to say what makes us want to and need to have laws to govern us, right? So Locke is one of the three. Every single political theorist who came after the middle to later part of the 1700s had read Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Every single one of them, including our founding fathers. And social contract theory was the fundamental driving force around which all other political philosophy came. So the answer to the question is, I can't answer the question in terms of A specific, but I can tell you that Locke had an extraordinary impact because all three of them did. Because those were the people uh, that influenced whatever, whatever output came from any of our founding fathers or, else, or, or others was driven by people contemplating those three different versions of man and then figuring out the rest. And they did that on their own. So that's, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. We are coming up on a holiday. We are coming up on Independence Day that we um, call the 4th of July. I don't think we should do that so much. You describe our language as sloppy and aggressive. Want to speak to that, Brent? Yeah, well, uh, I hope that through the course of this evening, uh, I've given you some examples of that. And, and I, I keep coming back to that story I told you at the end about what if those kids from Hope College had come to that event uh, that I was at in Philadelphia, and how they would have come in and been so warmly welcomed, and then the minute that the, the speakers would have started using those uh, pejorative terms, which they knew were directed in the way gener people generally think towards people generally like them, uh, we would have lost an opportunity to have a wonderful conversation and discussion and, and figuring out how to work together with two brilliant young minds because they would have left. We're so sloppy in our language, so sloppy. Start with prepositions, don't leave them hanging. And uh, do better with prepositions. And, and, what but, do you mean by that? Um, well, uh, after the show, where are we going to? Oh, I understand the grammatical rule. I thought you were making a larger political point. <laughs> no, I, well, I am. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying desperately to say, it, it, if you're looking for a specific point, it's hard to make it because it's a big general point. We need to think before we speak. We are ready, fire, aim with our speech. And this, is, this has become dangerous because we all know, we all know that we're not uh, able to have civil conversations anymore and make the argument in the book that we're actually becoming addicted to confrontation. We're craving it. We're looking for it. Just the way I used to look, like a, look for a glass of bourbon. All right? <laughs> and if I don't drink anymore, you don't have to fight with words anymore. Uh, so if we choose them more carefully, we can do better. And if you don't know the words to choose, then just ask a question. You know, a lot of times I can be at, at some party or something where I really just don't want to be there. And we all know the person you get cornered by that, I mean, the last time they, they brushed your te their teeth, you were little. And, you know, and they, they know a great deal about a great many things, and you're just really not there. What do you do? We well, ask them questions, and off they go. So you can do that as a distraction to be polite, to not have to really, but, 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 but. If you don't know what to say, if you haven't put the thought into the words you want to choose, it's much easier to ask a question. So ask one. You'd be fascinated by what people will tell you if you ask them. Two people changed the course of all of Western civilization. 
One on the secular side, one on the religious side. Socrates and Jesus Christ. Two things in common. They both died for their activism, and they both changed the course of history by asking questions. So if you can't find the right words, ask a question. You can usually find one of those. Mm -hmm. Try is it. Try are they. Try am I. Uh, it's interesting that you're going there because there's a comment from one of our audience members that says, are you aware that God has cooked into the Bible more than 60 instructions for dialogue and none for one-way communications? So there it is. That's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thought. That's, so, there it is. Yeah, we can even, we can even invoke the deity in, for help here. Yeah. Um, it seems like civility is just sort of disappearing right before our eyes, Brent. Uh, was it always an illusion? And um, there's a question from the audience about, the, with this amount of it, division, are we really heading for a civil war? So I address the civil war thing uh, in, in the book. Uh, my answer to the civil war thing is an emphatic no, it's not going to happen. It won't happen. For, for a few reasons. Here, I'll ruin the read. Uh, one of which, in order to get people to get to that point, a couple of things kind of have to be true. First of all, you have to feel as though you have nothing left to lose. The other one is, you have to feel as though you've got a reasonably good chance of winning. Now, let's put those two things together in today's America. First of all, nothing to lose. How many folks at home, raise your hand, be honest, have a television screen in one of your rooms that's at least 50 inches or more? That's a pretty good show of hands. How many people in this room have a smartphone connected to the internet where you can do anything you want all day long? Raise your hand. Right. How many people in this room own a car? How many people in this room own, own two? How many own three? Still hands going up. So we are extraordinarily extraordinarily comfortable. We're extraordinarily comfortable. And so we, we, can, uh, we can get used to this and we can say, oh, this is terrible. Wow, we're really losing all of our freedom. Oh my God, look, Netflix just dropped season two, right? <laughs> and so there's that problem. And then there's the possibility of winning problem. Unlike any time in all of human history, if you look at the weaponry possessed, but you can say, oh, I've got, I've got my, so a uh, big shout out to my high school friends. There's 13 of us in a group, class of 1980. We get together every year. We text all day long. Uh, we're inseparable friends. Some of these guys, we're all from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right? And some of these guys have more weapons than there are people in this room. God love them. And, I, and the, all the ammunition, I always say, guys, you know what? Here's the problem. If you ever need to use everything you have, you're going to be one round short because the state is better equipped with technology and weaponry than any one of us could ever be. And how would we pull it all off? And how would we all get together to do it? And oh, by the way, now Netflix drops season three. <laughs> so, so no, there won't, there won't be a civil war. Do I think civility has declined? Uh, yes, I do. I think the id is loose. If, um, you know, Freud, Freud uh, you know, forget all the sex with your mother and stuff, all that, right? Freud was the most brilliant sociologist, I think, who ever lived. And, and he talked about how in civil society, in order for it to work, humans need to sublimate all their base urges. We live in constant frustration in civil society because we always have to fight well, ourselves. We have to hold back, right? I think we used to do a better job of holding back. The id is loose. And so the question always is, once a beast escapes, can you recage it? That's what we're trying to do with our program. You know, we're trying to teach young people. Uh, social media, by the way, isn't to blame for anything. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. Prosecutor and judge in New York, not to blame for the Trump's case, they aren't. Social media is nothing more than a bottle on a bar table in front of an empty glass and a drunk. You can pick it up or you can leave it alone. I don't care what the prosecution did in the Trump case. I don't care what the judge did. Twelve citizens committed treason by convicting him. 
and I'm not a big Trump supporter. I'm just not. For a whole bunch of reasons. I don't dislike him either. I just, you know, it's not my thing, right? It's not my thing. It's us. It's us. We're the ones. We're the ones on juries. We're the ones that go on X or Facebook and post hateful content. It's not social media. It's not, it's not prosecutors. It's us. Brent, I want to, would you answer one more question before we let you Oh, hell, uh, I'd stay here all books. night. But <laughs> okay. you folks have stuff to do because Netflix just dropped season four. Right. Okay. Okay. So you're in your living room. Uh, you're at the kitchen table. You're at your brother-in-law's house. And you're, everybody's kind of tense and holding back. And you know it's coming. You know something ugly is coming. Okay. Could you give us uh, a scenario? A very, very brief one, if you would, please, of how yeah. that might be handled better than it has been in the last three years for most folks. Okay. So are, are, are we talking about any particular scenario that You're, I'm supposed you to pick, infer? You pick. You okay. pick. I mean, we can pick in almost, we have so many topics right. that we can't talk about. How many of you cannot t talk in some of the environments that you're in? Or you're afraid to talk? Or you talk and people leave and scream at you? Or they don't invite you back? Or, or you don't even want to invite them because you can't bear it? Okay, the, the, Look, those kind of things. Could you just uh, give us some, a couple of um, yeah. words, tools, briefly? Yep. So at the, at the risk of sounding as though I'm running out of material, uh, I want to stress the importance of asking questions. The scenario, excuse me, that you're describing uh, happens in, in my world regularly. And, um, and I can think of a Thanksgiving dinner a few years ago where it happened with a young lady uh, who just burst down into this sort of anti-Trump raid and uh, very uncomfortable. But um, the, the, the thing to do is to take that hostile person and, it, and, and to let them do what they do and then say, uh, look, I hear you and I can tell how, how passionate you are about this. I see it differently. We coach the kids in Common Ground, by the way, to never say, I disagree. We teach them to say, I see it differently. No fight or flight response. Doesn't trigger anything. You say, I, I see it differently. I want to understand, you just said X. And, um, and that to me, so to me, I'm not able to understand that. So I want you to explain more about what you mean. Now, I'm not talking about you surrendering to their opinion. I'm talking about how to tame a tiger. Ask it questions. We need conversions in this country. Conversions best come voluntarily. The only ones that stick come voluntarily. Las Casas taught us that, the great Spanish missionary. What's the best way to get a voluntary conversion? It's to, hear, it's to have somebody hear something absolutely brilliant that they've never thought of, but not from you, from themselves. And that might just happen if you ask them questions and they have to answer. I diffuse ugly situations all the time by asking questions. I don't just mean at dinner tables, I do it in business setting with my consulting clients. Ask questions, get them to continue to answer questions. You could say if one was cynical, it's like, buying flowers for a girl, it gives the illusion that you care. <laughs> but, but to not be cynical and be truthful, uh, the, the truth is that engaging people by asking questions is the best way to get them to convert. I refer you then in closing to my example before, Socrates and Jesus Christ. They did pretty well. You don't have to get yourself killed, skip that part. <laughs> but if you want to change the world, change it by asking questions. Please, please think about starting with, am I? That's a good one. Uh, Brent says that dissidents need one another, not just for efficacy, but for sanity. So thank you all for being together tonight. We hope that you uh, use Brent's words that we go forth rationally and constructively. Brent, thank you for shoring up our sanity tonight with your tenacity, so thoughtfully and digitally. It was fun. Bringing your breast best to the fight for freedom. We so appreciate it. Brent Hamacek. Thank you. Isn't, isn't she tiny? <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. 
Thank you for watching our presentation. Please like and subscribe to our channel to get updates on new speakers and consider joining the Liberty Forum of Silicon Valley. You can do so at our website. If you don't want to join, but want to support the principles of American liberty, you can make a tax deductible donation via our website. The links are in the description. Thank you again and stay free.